independent mechanism for monitoring repressive measures against NGOs. Second, the United Nations Human Rights Council needs to do more to protect civil society. Freedom of association is the only freedom defined in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights that does not enjoy specific attention from the UN human rights machinery. That must change. Third, we will be working with regional and other organizations such as the OAS, the EU, the OIC, the African Union, the Arab League, others to do more to defend the freedom of association. Many of these groups are already committed to upholding democratic principles on paper, but we need to make sure words are matched by actions. And fourth, we should coordinate our diplomatic pressure. I know that the Community of Democracies Working Group is focused on developing a rapid response mechanism to address situations where the freedom of association comes under attack. Well, that can't happen soon enough. When NGOs come under threat, we should provide protection where we can and amplify the voices of activists by meeting with them publicly at home and abroad and citing their work in what we say and do. We can also provide technical training that will help activists make use of new technologies such as social networks. When possible, we should also work together to provide deserving organizations with financial support for their efforts. Now, there are some misconceptions around this issue, and I'd like to address it. In the United States, as in many other democracies, it is legal and acceptable for private organizations to raise money abroad and receive grants from foreign governments so long as the activities do not involve specifically banned sources, such as terrorist groups. Civic organizations in our country do not need the approval of the United States government to receive funds from overseas. And foreign NGOs are active inside the United States. We welcome these groups in the belief that they make our nation stronger and deepen relationships between Americans and the rest of the world. And it is in that same spirit that the United States provides funding to foreign civil society organizations that are engaged in important work in their own countries. And we will continue this practice and we would like to do more of it in partnership with other democracies. As part of that commitment, today I am announcing the creation of a new fund to support the work of embattled NGOs. We hope this fund will be used to provide legal representation, communication technology such as cell phone and internet access, and other forms of quick support to NGOs that are under siege. The United States will be contributing $2 million to this effort and we welcome participation and contribution from like-minded countries as well as private not-for-profit organizations. The persecution of civil society activists and organizations where they are fighting for justice and law, for clean and open government, for public health or a safe environment or honest elections is not just an attack against people we admire. It's an attack against our own fundamental beliefs. So when we defend these brave people, we are defending an idea that has been and will remain essential to the success of every democracy. So the stakes are high for us, not just them. For the United States, supporting civil society groups is a critical part of our work to advance democracy. But it's not the only part. Our national security strategy reaffirms that democratic values are a cornerstone of our foreign policy, over time, as President Obama has said, America's values have been our best national security asset. I emphasized this point in December and January when I delivered speeches on human rights and internet freedom. And it is a guiding principle in every meeting I hold and every country I visit. My current trip is a good example. I've just come from Ukraine where I had the opportunity not only to meet with the foreign minister and the president, but with a wonderful group of young, bright Ukrainian students, where I discuss the importance of media freedom, the importance of freedom of assembly, and of human rights. Tonight, I'll leave for Azerbaijan, where I'll, where I'll meet with youth activists to discuss internet freedom and to raise the issue of the two imprisoned bloggers and to discuss civil liberties. From there, I'll go to Armenia and Georgia, where I will be similarly raising these issues and sitting down with leaders from women's groups and other NGOs. 
This is what we all have to do day in and day out around the world. So let me return to that three-legged stool. Civil society is important for its own sake, but it also helps prop up and stabilize the other legs of the stool, governments and markets. Without the work of civic activists and pluralistic political discourse, governments grow brittle and may even topple. And without consumer advocates, unions, and social organizations that look out for the needs of society's weakest members, markets can run wild and fail to generate broad-based prosperity. We see all three legs of the stool as vital to progress in the 21st century. So we will continue raising democracy and human rights issues at the highest levels in our contacts with foreign governments. And we will continue promoting economic openness and competition as a means of spreading broad-based prosperity and shoring up representative governments who know they have to deliver results for democracy. But we also believe that the principles that bring us here together represent humanity's brightest hope for a better future. As Foreign Minister Geremek wrote in his invitation to the inaugural meeting of the Community of Democracies 10 years ago, Regardless of the problems inseparably associated with democracy, it is a system which best fulfills the aspirations of individuals, societies, and entire peoples, and most fully satisfies their needs of development, empowerment, and creativity. So ultimately, our work on these issues is about the type of future we want to leave to our children and grandchildren. And anyone who doubts this should look at Poland. The world we live in is more open, more secure, and more prosperous because of individuals like Lech Walesa, Adam Michnik, others who work through the solidarity movement to improve conditions in their own country and to stand for freedom and democracy. I think often about the role of journalists. Journalists are under tremendous pressure. But a journalist like uh, Jerzy Torowicz, a son of Krakow, asked tough questions that challenged Poland to do better. And Pope John Paul II, who as Stalin would have noted, had no battalions, marshaled moral authority that was as strong as any army. We all have inherited that legacy of courage. It is now up to us. Every 4th of July, Americans affirm their belief that all human beings are created equal, that we are endowed by our creator with unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Today, as a community of democracies, let us make it our mission to secure those rights. We owe it to our forebears, and we owe it to future generations to continue the fight for these ideals. Thank you all very much. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome His Excellency Audronius Azubalis, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Lithuania, the current Chair of the Community of Democracies. Excellency, you have the floor. Dear colleagues, friends of democracy and freedom fighters, First of all, let me start by thanking Poland for organizing this important event for the world democratic community. Knowing that Poland had to live through during these last months, including the tragic crash of President Kaczynski's airplane, as well as devastating floods with losses of human lives, your efforts to welcome us here merit a very special appreciation by all of us. I would like also to thank the government of the United States and personally Madam State Secretary for the strong engagement to the 
community of democracies, which let 